So uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the current knowledge about ways maybe that we can prevent Alzheimer's disease. And as a general outline for the talk, uh, I want to get us all kind of on the same page and understanding what Alzheimer's disease is, period. And I'm going to spend a little time talking about what it looks like in the brain. That's kind of my job. I'm a, more of a molecular biologist, so I don't get away from the lab too often, so this is great fun. I'm going to tell you why we think it's important to really pay attention to Alzheimer's disease and people with Down syndrome, what the link is between the two um, events and syndromes. I'll spend a little bit of time, only really one slide, talking about the pharmacological avail uh, treatments are for Alzheimer's disease because there really isn't a lot right now. But I'll spend a lot more time talking about the behavioral or the non-pharmacological interventions that we can use to improve quality of life in people with dementia. Now, a lot of these data are from sporadic Alzheimer's disease, but you'll see that they obviously will apply nicely to people with Down syndrome of developed dementia. But then there's going to be some caveats, and I'm going to point those out as we go along, because we cannot assume that Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome <coughs> excuse me, is identical to the disease in the general population. In fact, there's some very unique features that we need to pay attention to, especially if we want to do good by our patients. Uh, so, and then the last part of the talk is going to, I'm going to tell you about some of the literature and some of what we're learning about prevention of Alzheimer's disease. I think we're all at the point now where we understand treating the disease is, is associated with very modest, if not negative, outcomes. So we really need to backtrack and think about ways to reduce our risk. <clears throat> so the good news is there are a lot of ways we can modify our risk. And you heard this morning Dr. Capone talked about modifiable risk factors. These are the things I'm going to focus on, and the good news is a lot of these are really fun. So <clears throat> in the beginning of the talk, you'll, it'll sound a little negative because I'm talking about the disease in the brain and what it looks like, but keep an open mind because it'll get a little bit more happy as we go along. <clears throat> it, is a, it is a tough disease, but there are ways to have a very good quality of life, even uh, when you're far along in a stage of dementia. So in terms of perspective, um, this is information the Alzheimer's Association in the U.S. shares. We understand now it is the sixth leading uh, cause of death in the elderly. And Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia in older people. Now, dementia can have several different causes. There's Lewy body disease, there's frontotemporal dementia, there's vascular dementia. Alzheimer's is the most common. The U.S. government is not spending a whole lot of money on trying to understand this disease. They put in a huge amount of time, and, uh, money, and investment into understanding cancer. And you can see our success rates with treating cancer have substantially improved, as has early detection. We're hoping and encouraging the government to think about investing more and more now into Alzheimer's research, because the numbers are going to increase dramatically. And we're going to have a lot of people that need a lot of help. Indeed, I think we under didn't quite get a good idea of how many people die with Alzheimer's disease. They, although they, the uh, current stats claim that it's the sixth leading cause of death, in a study by Dr. James and colleagues, he went back and looked through death certificates and looked back to see if they also had had dementia. And a common cause of death in people with dementia is pneumonia. So the death certificate may say pneumonia, but it won't be necessarily linked to Alzheimer's disease, so those numbers have been underrepresented. When he looked at those numbers, it turns out there are five times more deaths than we thought of people dying with Alzheimer's disease. And his estimates are that really it's closer to the third leading cause of death. And we know, again, those numbers are going to shift. So that means we do have, we, we, need, we have to do a lot of work. We need to invest a lot of time and effort into this. Now, just historically speaking, Alzheimer's disease was first described in the early 1900s, which tells you a little something. We haven't learned over 100 years ways in which to really change the course of this disease. This first person that Dr. Alzheimer's described was a very famous patient. All of us in the field know her name by name, Augusta D. And she presented at a very young age to Dr. Alzheimer's with a series of symptoms, which include language problems, disorientation. She had a lot of unpredictable behaviors. Um, she was very paranoid. For example, she was convinced her husband was having multiple affairs auditory hallucinations, so she really did have a lot of problems, and she was very young. Now, of course, in the early century, people weren't living as long as they do now. But more recently, it was um, her brain tissue was still available for study, and there was a group that tried to understand if she had a genetic mutation 
that caused her disease, because a very small number of families do carry a mutation. And usually that happens with earlier age of onset, but apparently she did not. This looked to be a pretty much spontaneous, sporadic Alzheimer's disease. Our clinicians are wonderful at diagnosing dementia. And when a person presents, they will get a diagnosis of possible or probable dementia. And our clinicians can make a pretty good rationalization for what kind of cause of that dementia is. It could be Alzheimer's disease, like I said, or frontotemporal dementia. They'll be able to make those calls based on the profile of, of clinical changes. So it's a progressive disease. I think you're all aware of that you start with a certain number of symptoms and they get progressively worse until function's affected. The unfortunate news <clears throat> is you cannot get a definite diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease until after a person has passed away. And if they've consented to autopsy, that's usually when a neuropathologist can look for very specific changes in the brain and say, yes, that person it did indeed have Alzheimer's, or it may come back. Wait a second, that wasn't, it was vascular or mini strokes that caused this dementia. And that can be very important for families to know, that they, it's, it's useful to have that information to understand what your own risks are. And as you can well imagine, it can be particularly challenging to diagnose dementia in people with intellectual disability. There are no standard tools that we have to detect change. In fact, most of the struggle that anybody who's in this field looking at aging and people with Down syndrome will tell you is, our tools aren't very sensitive and they're not very good and they bottom out very quickly or they just simply don't work. And that's another assumption clinicians in, may assume is the same tests that work in the general population to diagnose dementia are not gonna apply here. So we don't have the same ability to test for language changes, for example, or how do you test for memory if somebody really can't tell you a lot of things. So we've been working very hard in our own studies to try to find tools that will help us measure change because ultimately we wanna do clinical trials to benefit people with Down syndrome, we need measures to show there's benefits. So as I mentioned, the only way we can say for sure somebody died with Alzheimer's disease is to look at the brain. And these are the kinds of general changes that you'll see. It looks pretty shocking that people lose a lot of brain tissue as they uh, go through this disease. And depending on how long they live with the disease, you'll see a different levels of loss of brain tissue. And as you can imagine, when somebody's diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, a lot of these changes are already in play. So it's really hard to reverse them. There might be ways to slow them down a little bit, but we're not at a point where we can actually reverse these changes. When we look at the brain specifically using a microscope and multiple different ways of doing this, um, this is a picture of Dr. Alzheimer, by the way. And Dr. Alzheimer described two kinds of brain changes. And these include these plaques which aren't green in your brain. These are a color I changed them so we can see them. And uh, you can see lots and lots of plaques that take up the space between neurons and they build up to a level, they have to be there in a certain number based on your age for that to be Alzheimer's disease. So what that means is I have seen a lot of brains in my time. I have seen 70, 80, 90, over 100 year old brains from people without dementia and I can find these plaques. So it's a normal part of aging to some extent it's just when it reaches these excessive levels that it compromises how the brain works, that we have a problem. But the second key feature that needs to be in the brain to say this is Alzheimer's disease are these neurofibrillary tangles. So these are, this is a pathology inside a neuron. That's the cells that communicate in your brain so that we can learn and remember. And you can see these fibrils. They actually are called tangles for that reason. It's a protein that we normally have lots of. Is a protein important for our cells to have structure so that they can talk? But in Alzheimer's disease, it becomes abnormally phosphorylated, so all these extra phosphorus groups get added on and it can't twist properly, and what happens is neurons become very, very unhappy. They become dysfunctional and ultimately they will die. So there, for the longest time, we didn't know what pathology came first, and it was actually, I think, what we learned from people with Down syndrome, we understand better what is going on here. So we have two forms of pathology, and you can imagine in our field, there is a huge amount of interest in trying to find therapies, treatments that hit those plaques to stop them from or clear them from the brain, and I can tell you more about those later. Only more recently have we been looking at trying to reduce tangles. Tangles are a little more challenging um, because they're inside a cell, so they're kind of protected, but there's some new interesting treatments coming from that as well. 
So what is the link between Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease? In other words, why are people with Down syndrome at higher risk for developing this disease? And let me just take a step back, and I know all of you probably know this very, very well, but it's quite relevant when we're thinking about Alzheimer's disease, is that um, the most common cause of Down syndrome is a full triplication of chromosome 21. And this was described by Lejeune in 1959. There's an interesting story here, and I like to put this slide up, uh, especially for women who are thinking about a career in science. Uh, Dr. Gauthier was actually critically involved with this discovery. And uh, Lejeune actually took a lot of the kudos for it. And her name was actually misspelled on the publication. So it was only more recently that recognition, due recognition, was given to her of her discovery. She'd actually found that extra copy of chromosome 21, and she sent it to Dr. Lejeune for photography, for pictures. That's the story, and I read that on Wiki. But there was a great interview with her in Science Magazine, I think a year or two years ago. So we get the most common cause of Down syndrome being an extra full copy of chromosome 21. We know that's 95, at least about 95% of people. We also have a, a, another cause of Down syndrome, that is where only a piece of chromosome 21 gets carried. So you only have a subset of genes on chromosome 21 being triplicated. Now if you think about that, we've learned some very, very interesting things from people who have partial trisomy. For example, um, we had followed at University of California in Irvine with Dr. Ira Lott, uh, a person with Down syndrome, looked like Down syndrome, had ID, and he only passed away just about a month ago now at the age of 73 or 74 without dementia. And it turns out that he is lacking a very important gene. One of the important genes was not triplicated in this fellow, so he didn't develop the Alzheimer's disease we typically see in people with Down syndrome. So I'll show you a little bit more about that in a second. And last, um, there's a form of Down syndrome called mosaicism. <clears throat> and that's where not all the cells in your body, say your liver, your kidneys, your brain, your skin, have the full extra copy of chromosome 21. Only a subset of your cells do. So mosaicism typically is described as percentage, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Think about it almost a little bit like a dose effect. The more mosaic, you know, the higher the percentage, the more of the Down syndrome phenotype that you'll see. It also may tell us that people who have very low levels of mosaicism might also be, might survive to longer, uh, later ages without dementia. But we, I don't think there's a lot of data on, on that yet. We have one person we're following who is mosaic, but she's also very complicated, so I'm not sure she, um, we'll get all the answers as well. So when we look at chromosome 21, it's the smallest cr uh, chromosome in, in our genome, which is nice. It makes it a little easier to work with. Uh, there's at least about 200 known genes. This, this slide, I have to remember to keep updating it because genes, you know, we, we learn more and more every year. But there are some key genes on chromosome 21 that we know from other studies are critically involved with Alzheimer's disease. Either it increases risk or it's associated with other factors that we see with this disease, like inflammation in the brain or oxidative stress or loss of neurons. There's genes that kind of represent all those things on chromosome 21. But an important one, and the one that has been a focus for many, many, many years, is the amyloid precursor protein. And it was actually working with people with Down syndrome that gave other researchers insights or leads that this gene, APP, might be really important for Alzheimer's. There are other genes on there. In fact, if you go through, you can, yes, go ahead. It stands for, I believe I have it here, amyloid precursor protein. And I'm going to go on to just a little bit more down this pathway. And one of the reasons I'm, I'm going through this is this is of anything you'll probably read in the news about treatments for Alzheimer's disease. It's going to be this protein that's the target. It's, it's a very, very hot topic. So this precursor protein, the gene makes uh, codes for a protein. This protein is very, very long. It's made of over 750 amino acids. And there's a nice cartoon I found that shows you get this kind of, it goes through the membrane and it's all tangled up. It forms a 3D shape. That's how proteins function. Although it's interesting, with this protein, we're not necessarily sure what it does naturally, even though we have it everywhere. It's in our platelets, in our blood, in our livers. It's, it's all over our body. A lot of cells make it. What happens in Alzheimer's disease 
and actually its normal, normal functioning of this precursor protein, normal processing, is it gets cut by enzymes, these are the little scissors, in two places to lead to a little tiny piece of that protein called a beta amyloid. And it's only 40 or 42 amino acids long, it's really teeny tiny. It gets cleaved off from this longer one. And it turns out that that shorter protein is very nasty. It likes to stick to itself. Neurons really don't like it around. So they become dysfunctional. They go through a lot of different, actually some neurons try to commit suicide when that stuff's around. They go through apoptosis. So these, these peptides accumulate and there's stages in how they accumulate. And you might remember this morning Dr. Cohn mentioned soluble beta amylate. That's a phase that this protein, the life of this protein goes through where at first when it's produced it's just these single little bits and oftentimes the brain can just turn it over. It's when it gets produced so much that they start to stick together is when you start to have problems. And ultimately you, you end up with these big plaques in the brain. And depending on what stage of disease somebody dies with Alzheimer's disease, the plaques will look, there'll be extensive plaque formation. And sometimes if somebody passes away very early in disease, the plaques will look a little different because they're, they're maturing too. They're going through their own lifespan in the brain. And when we look at the brains of people with Down syndrome, those plaques have a slightly different look to them too because they're making so much more of that protein right from birth which is kind of fascinating when you think about it because if somebody's making that toxic peptide all through their life, why aren't people born with Alzheimer's disease? There's obviously some other factors that are really important associated with aging that need to come into play for this to happen. The biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is age. So a lot of therapies are targeting this protein for that reason. So can you imagine if we can prevent that cleavage and prevent that beta amyloid from being deposited? Or what if we can go in and bust up those plaques and get rid of them? And those things are actually doable now. So here's an example of somebody who passed away with Down syndrome. When I was at UC Irvine, and this is where I got interested in Down syndrome, <coughs> I worked with a wonderful pediatric neurologist, Ira Lott, and we had a number of families that Ira had been following for many, many years, lovely families, and they were beginning to donate brains for us to do research, to understand what the changes were that were in the brain. And the beautiful thing about that kind of gift is it stays for decades. I don't know if people understand that we, we look at that brain tissue for decades. It, it never goes away. So, um, and I have permission from mom here to show pictures because she wants to, to spread the word that we need to think about this some more. So this was a fellow who died in, in his late 40s and he had a rather typical progression in terms of dementia. And I think there were others who have talked more about clinical science, so I won't go into that too much. But what this picture shows, it's from the frontal cortex at the front of the brain, and you can see all those plaques very easily. So this is the 42 amino acid long plaques. There's also some of these plaques that contain a slightly shorter version of that peptide, which is thought to be a little less toxic, but it also starts to collect. But importantly, look at these big blood vessels. That beta amyloid peptide loves to be on blood vessels, and when it's there, it makes the blood vessels stiffer. So they have trouble dilating, dilating and constricting. So we're appreciating more and more and more that even though people with Down syndrome seem to be protected against some of the vas typical vascular risk factors like atherosclerosis and blood hypertension, there might be another kind of vascular issue here that we need to think about in terms of preventing or slowing Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome. So one of the goals of our longitudinal aging study, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it, is to see if we can, we can see this by pictures of the brain when we do MRI. So we're starting to track these changes. If we capture those pictures a certain way, we can see these really pretty clearly. So we're trying to understand if somebody has more of these, does that mean they have an earlier age of onset? Or does the disease go faster? Or if somebody has less of these, does the disease, does, does dementia kick in at all later? So we'd like to understand that because this is one of those modifiable risk factors potentially. So what is the age of onset of Alzheimer's disease neuropathology? And I know this is where everybody hears and everybody's been told Alzheimer's disease starts in the 40s, right? The true definition of Alzheimer's disease is you have to have clinical 
dementia and the neuropathology. Okay? So in people with Down syndrome, what we do see is that after the age of 40, almost all people with the full extra copy of chromosome 21 have enough plaques and tangles in their brains for a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And this is data that's been generated since at least 1993, and everybody's replicated this. And what's uh, um, something else to note about is even though by age 40, virtually 100% of people have Alzheimer's disease changes, there's also a, a very short time interval, about 10 years, where those changes seem to happen very rapidly. And that's something we want to keep in mind when we think about prevention studies and, and, and ways to prevent Alzheimer's disease. Not only is it going to be what we target, it's going to be important to think about when we target. Now, I know this looks like bad news. And I know this is where a lot of families have been told you're all going to get Alzheimer's disease when you get to a certain age if you have Down syndrome. But I think there's some really interesting news that I'll get to in just a minute. I'm going to keep you hanging a little bit longer. What's going to help our understanding of when somebody with Down syndrome will develop dementia, or if they will develop dementia, it would be awfully good if we could see these plaques in the brain when somebody was still alive. In fact, it's good for everybody if we find a treatment to know to use this as a diagnostic tool. Also, if we have a treatment that's going to change beta amyloid, we want to see it change in the brain. There is a compound that is used pretty consistently now. It's, it's um, used virtually all the time, depending on the scenario, where we can do PET imaging. And this involves injecting a person with a ligand. It's radioactive. But this little ligand will go into the blood and then up into the brain and will stick to those plaques. And then with the right kind of imaging, technology can see those plaques in the brain. So in this picture, and this is what these fuzzy wuzzy pictures kind of look like because the technique itself doesn't give you high resolution, but it does give you a nice signal, is all the red and yellow spots are where there's lots of plaques in this person's brain. And this is a comparison to show you in a study by Ben Handen's group at University of Pittsburgh, and Ben's a terrific psychiatrist who's been doing a lot of imaging research to understand what the early signs of dementia might be in people with Down syndrome. You can see somebody who's 38 doesn't have a lot of plaques that this compound can stick to, whereas somebody who's 44, you can see lots of plaques. And look at where they are. A lot of them are in the frontal cortex. And the frontal cortex, as you know, is where executive function happens. So we might predict from some of this work that maybe some of our tools to detect dementia might be better or might be more sensitive if they, they measure frontal lobe function. And oftentimes, those are behavioral changes. And we don't capture those necessarily very well clinically. That might be a lot different from what we see in sporadic Alzheimer's disease. In typical Alzheimer's disease, everybody talks about memory going first, although there are variants of Alzheimer's disease where frontal function starts to go first. So maybe in some ways, we're missing our diagnostic um, capability or our hits because we're looking kind of for the wrong changes. So I think these kinds of data are absolutely uh, critical for us to understand when, how, where, and what we might predict is going to happen in terms of cognition or behavior. And Ben's been following a group of people with Down syndrome who are over 40 years of age. He took what he would consider that high-risk age group. And you can see that there's a linear increase with these plaques over age. So as, as these volunteers are aging in his study, they're showing progressively more plaques as they get older. But you can see there's a huge amount of variability, right? Not everybody's behaving the same here. And that's actually a really good thing. Statistically, everybody struggles with it, but I think this is the best. This is where you want to look at individual people and say, wow, what are you doing? <laughs> Your brain looks great. So uh, Ben has got a much bigger study going now. Um, I'll keep your eyes peeled for some beautiful data, hopefully, that'll come out. Mm -hmm. Is this someone who's doing this? This is a study by Ben Handy, yes. So I, mean, asking I would think he is, and I'm going to see him in a couple of weeks. He's coming to visit, and I will ask him about that. But that's where the power of this approach is, is to identify those individual differences. Yeah. So all of the, his volunteers are getting a full neuropsych workup, and so he'll be able to speak to perhaps some of that. And this is a composite score, so it's measuring the plaques throughout the entire brain. 
it would be really interesting, I think, to look at all the plaques in the frontal cortex and how that's linked to kind of frontal behavioral problems or, you know. But I know Ben is probably going in that direction. He's, he's a pretty smart guy. So I've talked a lot about these plaques. And there's a reason why I talk a lot about these plaques is they're what we think, especially in people with Down syndrome, these plaques are the earliest pathology that we tend to see in the brain. It was really hard to figure this out in sporadic Alzheimer's disease because by the time somebody comes to autopsy, typically their brain is at end stage. So they would show plaques and tangles. We could never say, well, what's coming first? And we want to know this because at different stages of disease, if different pathologies are developing, we want to target them appropriately. For example, do I want to use a tau targeted or a tangle targeted therapy when there aren't any yet? Or vice versa, is it too late to target beta amyloid if tangles are there? So what we've learned by working with people with Down syndrome is I think really fascinating and, and, and very, very helpful. And that is when we look at different ages of people who passed away, we can see in their 30s, we typically see mostly just plaques, just plaques. And you can see they're kind of small and they're light and they're fluffy. Um, I think some of those are being degraded and turned over and then being deposited again. And then as we get into the late 30s, we start to see little tangles start to show up. And by the time we get to 40, we have full-blown tangles and plaques. And here, the, the, the blue-gray is the tangles. And the brown is the plaques. And this is all from the frontal cortex again. So what we're learning very clearly from working with people with Down syndrome is that the plaques come before the tangles. And we couldn't say that about the general population. So this also tells us that if we're going to think about prevention and we have plaques in the 30s, then if we have something that modifies those plaques, we probably want to consider doing them in the early 30s, if not 20s. And depending on what that intervention is, if it doesn't have an adverse effect, people might be willing to try. If it does, that's a whole different conversation. Now, I talked about the pathology, and that sounds like all the grim news. It's by 40, everybody has this disease in their brains. You know, what does that, what does that mean in the real world? So as I reminded you, 40 is kind of the hot spot here for people with Down syndrome. But when you look at the age of when you start to see signs of dementia, something really fascinating pops out. So this is a, a beautiful uh, paper published by Nicole Schupf at Columbia, where she looked at a whole bunch of clinical studies of people with Down syndrome, as just studies watching people as they get older and what changes we see, and when do they develop dementia. And when she put all these studies together, a couple of two really, really interesting things came of it. The first is, if you look from 35 to 50, the change or the, the number of people with dementia isn't changing. It's pretty flat. After 50, the number of people who are demented starts to climb pretty rapidly. This is also a feature, unfortunately, of people with Down syndrome is that dementia comes on pretty quick. Uh, but uh, there's, so we know that there's at least a 10 year delay between when you have Alzheimer's disease in your brain and when the brain comes to a point where it starts to not function as well and you start to see the signs of dementia. That is a good thing. That means the brain can compensate for these Alzheimer's disease pathologies. If we can figure out how the brain is doing that, that's a great target for us to manipulate to keep the brain healthy. And we have a few clues, and I'll, I'll go into those a little bit later. So that 10-year gap is really, I think, terrific. It gives us a chance to intervene again. So maybe somebody can have Alzheimer's disease pathology in their brains and not show clinical signs of dementia. And in fact, this doesn't just happen in people with Down syndrome. There are lots of autopsy cases have been reported where people have passed away in their 70s, 80s, 90s, and older with full-blown Alzheimer's disease pathology in their brains with no signs of dementia, okay? So they're called high pathology controls. And there's a lot of us who are really fascinated by these people that try to understand again, what are they eating? What are they doing? What medicine are they taking, you know? There could be some clues there to help us find a treatment. So the second really good news from this graph is look at the percentage. It doesn't reach 100. We have one study here, I believe, over 60, and I think this is limited to just one person. Numbers of people in these studies is very, very small, which is why Nicole put all these studies together to get enough power to see 
But most of the time, and we're seeing this more and more, is we're only talking, there's at least 15 to 20% of people with Down syndrome who go into very old age, over 60s, who don't seem to show signs of dementia. And I think that's fantastic news. I know that some researchers think that maybe those people are partial trisomy 21 or mosaic, but the data actually don't support that. These people were confirmed partial, uh, full trisomy 21 and they made it to that age. Maybe we can't detect dementia very well, it's still a possibility. Nonetheless, obviously they were functioning well enough to not look demented. So I think that's very, very good news and I think that tells us we need to be optimistic about this. This is not, you know, a prognosis for everybody as they get older. Even with sporadic Alzheimer's, when you have a lot of Alzheimer's in your family, or you have certain risk factors, genetic risk factors, it's not a done deal. That's my good news. So I'm going to work off of that for a little bit. So let me just take a quick sidestep and tell you a little bit about our study because what I talked about here raises some very interesting questions that we need to understand so that we can come up with good ways to slow Alzheimer's or prevent Alzheimer's in people with Down syndrome. We need to find ways to diagnose the disease as early as we can because the earlier we can intervene, just like any disease, the earlier the better. And even if there is a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and we're not too sure about all the treatments that are available, we know they're not necessarily going to stop the disease. We can still find ways to improve quality of life. So our study, we were initially funded about five years ago and we asked for volunteers in the community who were 35 years and older to come join our study. And anybody who was demented or not demented was welcome to come join. And all we wanted to do at that point is we had a very simple hypothesis, a very simple question. And we thought the frontal lobes seemed to be a real hot spot for people with Down syndrome. So maybe changes in the way the frontal lobes work will tell us that somebody's converting to dementia. And why is that happening? What is it about the frontal cortex that drives this? So the way we've been trying to answer this question is to bring people into our study and follow them every year. And we've just been renewed for another five years. So some of our folks are going to be going up to 10 years, hopefully, as long as they'll stay with us. We initially started with every six month visits, but with the funding being what it is, don't get me started, we had to drop it back to a year. And in the next five years, actually, we've gone to even younger people, 25 years and older, because in thinking about prevention, again, we need to capture the younger folks because maybe what's going on there is different when they hit their 30s and then they hit their 40s. So we want to make sure whatever, again, treatments we have is going to be good at the right age. So we have a wonderful team, a research team. Uh, it includes two neurologists, a pediatric neurologist. He's a fan favorite of our volunteers. And Dr. Jaika, who is a specialist in Alzheimer's disease in the general population. He's in our Alzheimer's Center. So we have a pediatric and a geriatric neurologist work on our study. We have a neuropsychologist team that measures learning and memory, so we do a lot of thinking and memory tests. Not all of them work that great, so we're, we continuously refine our measures. We have Im an imaging team, so Eileen Ling is helping us look at vascular changes, all using non-invasive approaches. We're really staying away from the PET and radio ligands because when we asked our families and our volunteers, they really were kind of antsy about doing that, so we wanted to honor, respect those wishes. Dave is a physicist who uh, looks at our MRI uh, scans. Dr. Donna Wilcock, uh, she looks at neuroinflammation in the brain. We have a series of studies that also look at plasma and also in autopsy samples. And Brian Gold is another imager with extensive experience looking at the link between clinical decline and changes by, in the brain. And Dr. Fred Schmidt, who's my right-hand man, I'm a molecular biologist, as I mentioned. Fred is a neuropsychologist, so we partnered up on this study. So we both learned to speak a different language. And it works great. We are, I think it's been really successful. Of course, the most important people in our study are our, our volunteers. And it's been a lot of fun to work with these people. The families have been wonderful, absolutely crazy supportive of this whole study. And we've been able to reach out to Cincinnati, Cincinnati to Louisville. The Louisville Downs Association is wonderful. Uh, so our studies getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We're hoping to have 80 people in total. We're about 65. So great study, great people, very special people who, who volunteer. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is to volunteer. So I kind of went through this. It's a little out of order. But there's our lovely volunteer again. Getting 
kissing, kissing your sister. So the goals of the study, and there's a number of studies, we're not the only ones by any stretch, um, there's some wonderful groups doing work like this, both nationally and internationally, is to find out what are the earliest signs that we want to maybe pick up on. So we want a more accurate diagnosis. Uh, again, the earlier we can pick up a change, the better our chances of managing and, and thinking about the future and, and improving quality of life. Very importantly, what kind of treatment do we want to try? And even more importantly for people with Down syndrome is when do we want to try those treatments? And also, if we're going to try something that we think is going to change the course of their disease, what clinical measures do we need to take to show that those changes are beneficial? We don't even have good tools to measure a response to a drug. So we're trying to, we're, we're very ambitious. We, there's a lot of things on our plate we're trying to work on. But those are the things, because we're hoping in future we're going to start to be able to offer clinical trials for families who are interested to see if there's ways we can slow down or prevent disease. All right, so now I'm going to take a big, a bit of a chunk of time, and I'm not sure how many people were in Dr. Thorpe's talk next door. Okay, um, I didn't realize there would, be, there would be a little bit of overlap, and she had the same thing, we kind of went, sorry. Um, so I'll tell you about the current quote, treatments for Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome. And this is going to be a little bit of a tough one. Currently, there are five drugs that are approved for use to treat Alzheimer's disease, FDA-approved drugs. I'm sorry, I'm going to talk a little bit from kind of the USA perspective, but I think the names might be slightly different here in Canada. Um, I should have updated this. So four to five of these drugs affect the cholinergic system. I think you might have heard about this. This is an, a chemical in the brain that neurons use to communicate and underlies learning and memory. And neurons that make this chemical die in Alzheimer's disease. So most of these drugs, what they do is enhance the ability of that chemical to stay in the brain before it's turned over. So it improves, in theory, it improves learning and memory. And another drug works off of a different mechanism. So in fact, Namenda can be used, no, don't quote me on this, I'm trying to remember. Uh, I believe Namenda can be used in combination with other drugs because they're working on different pathways. The unfortunate thing with these medicines is um, there's very limited success and or benefits to patients who receive this. So in Alzheimer's disease in general, a lot of times the side effects of these medicines are far worse than any benefit gained. And it's important to try things, and there's different formulations and different doses, and, and, but it, it may be that those side effects are just way too unpleasant. Um, they can cause sleep problems, incontinence, uh, GI effects. So choosing or thinking about using some of these medicines to treat Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome should be a really good consult with a doc and ask a lot of questions and pay a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. In the testing of these, I wondered if it's about vaccines mm -hmm. um, Is there a, a population of people with Down syndrome who are in the testing for this? Like You're way ahead of me. No, very few. That's the other thing. There's again that big assumption that it's Alzheimer's disease, it's Alzheimer's disease, and we're just going to try these medicines and pretend it's the same. Can you imagine some of these side effects in people with Down syndrome? I mean, this is really, I don't call it improving life. Yes? Mm -hmm. You know, the data don't even support a maintenance. It seems to, in some studies, there might be a, a little bit of slowing, but it never stops it. it, never, it and, and typically, at least what the physicians have told me, and I believe the reports are out there, that only some people benefit and for a short time. And I think most times people go off because of the side effects. So they are only treating the symptom of the disease. They're not treating the disease itself, and that's part of the problem. So now, if you take a good hard look at what has been published in people with Down syndrome treated with these medicines, you'll be in for a big, big disappointment. Uh, most of these studies I'm going to tell you, I'm going to summarize them in this one slide. That's how many of them there are. Uh, most of these studies are very small, uh, so there might be 40 or 60 people with Down syndrome. Um, a lot of times they're done in people who already have dementia, which is really hard 
to bring somebody back from that, to see an improvement. And actually, some of these drugs have been tested in younger adults with Down syndrome because that cholinergic pathway is also potentially compromised as a part of Down syndrome. So some researchers are thinking this might be something we can work on when somebody's younger to improve learning and memory. That's a whole different ballgame. So memantine uh, did not result in a benefit in one study of adults with Down syndrome who were demented. There have been very small studies of denepazil um, showing very small, if not negative, or no benefit, uh, with very high numbers of side effects. And I, this is the one I noticed, I had a big typo there. Uh, although it may be, a, there may be a hint in women with Down syndrome that um, denepazil might be helpful, but this is a study of 21 people. And oftentimes when we do small, small studies like that, they don't work when you do bigger samples. So if you're reading any of this literature, Keep a critical eye to how many people are in the study and what they're measuring, too. Some of the measures that we have, I could say, are really, they're troublesome. There's only been one study of Exelon, and that was to see if the patch might work well for people with Down syndrome. All they wanted to do was see if they could tolerate it. And patches are wonderful because if you don't have to worry about taking a pill all the time, especially when you have a dementia, this is a great way to get around it. There's been no studies in people with Down syndrome looking at galantamine. Tacrin. So we still don't know how these drugs work really for people with Down syndrome and who are demented. So I think the take home message with this, and this is partly a, a personal bias, is it's got to be a conversation that you have with your physician. And if you're going to try these medicines, and I don't think it's unreasonable not to try them, I know Dr. Thorpe would probably disagree with me a little bit because she doesn't use them at all now. And she's got the experience, so I would trust her that you have, paying attention to the side effects is going to be critical. Because again, if there is going to be a marginal benefit, and yet the side effects are so bad, you know, there might be other things that you can do. And I'm going to tell you about those now that don't involve using these drugs. There's a lot more exciting things coming in the pipeline, and I'll try and get to some of those at the end. So some of the key things in thinking about improving quality of life or maintaining quality of life in a person with dementia. And these things, I'll, I'll be clear, I took a lot of these from the Alzheimer's Association website. Their website is absolutely fantastic. And when you look at some of those behavioral issues and how they suggest um, dealing with them, it's just a wealth of information there that is really helpful. So I would strongly encourage you to take a look if you're interested. But they have done a lot of work and supported a lot of research into finding ways to improve quality or keep quality of life. Now, in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease, we typically see irritability, anxiety, and depression is a biggie. And later, those symptoms can shift, become more severe, or go away. So there might be anger, agitation, aggression, restlessness as the disease progresses. And importantly, there's sleep disturbances. And I'm going to focus on that one a little bit more, too. So obviously, there's going to be ways to deal with this that could be pharmacological or non-pharmacological. So let's just think about non-pharmacological for a second. Uh, when a person with dementia starts to show some of these behavior, if this is a change, take a look what's going on around them. Don't just assume it's the dementia, it's the disease. That's what's, what's happening here. There could be a lot of changes going on in that person's life that is very frightening and unsettling to them and it causes this agitation. And things like moving somebody into assisted care or bringing somebody into the home to help with home care, uh, that gives them Feelings of losing control, independence, can lead to a lot of paranoia, misperceived threats. Uh, some things being asked repeatedly, please change, please take a bath, can get really frustrating to them. There might be some medical conditions ongoing there that they can't express to you. And this is, I think, particularly important when, you, when we think about people with Down syndrome who have become demented, is they could have an infection, or they might be in pain, or they might have constipation too hot, too cold, these things cause agitation. You don't just want to med them against anxiety, agitation. It would be better to figure out if there's something going on under that that does need a treatment. It could be that their hearing or vision is diminished, so somebody comes in the room, they don't hear, and it's shocking, and it upsets them. So thinking about that person, the setting they're in, changes in the environment, taking a good look to see if there's something physical going on that's contributing to pain or discomfort, 
would be first line things to, to look at for somebody with dementia. We can modify the environment to make it more comfortable and familiar to that person so that they feel better. It's their place, that they have ownership, they have control. Um, there's some suggestions about giving people with dementia uh, a stuffed animal or a blanket that's theirs, it's they can keep it, it's a familiar thing. Because they stop recognizing people as the disease goes on, so that gets a little spooky. Very importantly, if you are going to be a caregiver for somebody with dementia um, and Down syndrome, then take care of yourself. Um, I think caregivers try to do too much and don't look for support when in fact there's lots of really wonderful support for a caregiver and you need to be in good shape if you're going to take care of that person with Down syndrome. And just, you know, checking in on people. Are you comfortable? Are you too hot? Are you too cold? If somebody's getting very upset about something, redirect their attention if possible. Acknowledge requests if they're asking about food or when's that barbecue and when's that barbecue and when's that barbecue. Just respond every time. And certainly don't take any of these behaviors personally. That person is not really, I'm sure, choosing to do this on purpose. But again, keep looking for reasons behind the behavior. Um, if somebody keeps asking about a certain event, put a calendar up perhaps with a big star and help them to, to look at that. So let's, you know, think about there's a lot of non-pharmacological interventions changing the environment that can make somebody more comfortable. But then it might come to a point where you really do have to look at this and approach this in a pharmacological sense. So, for example, somebody who's very agitated and, and isn't sleeping well, they may have, be, have a depression on top of this dementia that's developing in the background. Well, de depression can be managed. And in fact, if you manage depression in somebody with dementia, if that's indeed what they're showing signs of, they will sleep better. And if they're sleeping better, then you're sleeping better and everybody's sleeping better. And the important thing to remember, again, when you're talking with your physicians, and, and be the advocate here, is low doses are, are a really good way to start. You don't want to get into super high dose things because everybody, as we get older, we get more and more sensitive to drugs. Same thing's happening in people with Down syndrome, so we don't need to whop them with high doses. Start with small and work up to see when you get a benefit. And you're probably, many of you may be familiar with a lot of the commonly used antidepressants, anxiolytics. I'm not an MD, so I'm just listing them here. The real expert was next door. Uh, there are some drugs you've got to be really super careful of because especially in people with dementia, some of the antipsychotics um, can lead to increased stroke or other complications that you, maybe you want to stay away from those when somebody's older. A big issue, and this is why I put this up again, I'm not sure how many of you got to see Dr. Jamie Edgens talk this earlier this morning. She's what I consider my expert on sleep apnea and sleep disturbances in people with Downs. But this is a very disruptive behavior for both the person with dementia and the family, and that is the this, this sleeping problem. And I think it's really important to consider that obstructive sleep apnea is something we need to seriously address in people with Down syndrome. Now we know it happens at a very young age, um, I think Jamie indicated that parents are not the greatest reporters of OSA. It's hard to see when, when kids are young. It certainly is a problem as you get older, more snoring, et cetera. But when the brain has intermittent episodes of not getting enough oxygen, cells start to die. So it's something we need to control early and all through life. And it may help a lot to consider this and intervene with this when somebody's older. So at least the brain's getting more oxygen and they're sleeping better. The daytime napping can be a problem because um, somebody's watching TV all day and they fall asleep and they wake up and then they fall asleep. Depression, depression as I mentioned, can contribute to the sleep problems. So it's, it's an important thing and probably maybe one of the major drivers of, in, in addition to incontinence, of why families can't take care of people at home. So there's, a, again, start with the non-pharmacological. And these things might be, you know, pretty, pretty uh, common sense, since we all have trouble sleeping one time or another, is maintain a regular schedule. Um, make sure the bed is only for sleeping. It's not for doing iPad movies and TV, and that might help. Putting safety lights around so if somebody gets up in the night, they're not going to fall down. Exercise, I'm going to come back to this one, is really good to help with sleep. Cholinesterase inhibitors, which are the four of the five drugs used to treat Alzheimer's disease, cause sleeplessness. So you might want to try, if you're using those medicines, take those in the morning. 
it's the very thing used to treat Alzheimer's causes another set of problems, so keep that in mind. Uh, somebody might be having pain, arthritis, um, like I said, simple things like constipation. Uh, if they're in pain, you're not going to sleep. It might be too hot, too cold. And um, if somebody is awake and active, you know, try and reduce the TV time. I know it's really nice to get a little break, but the TV is where people fall asleep when they're not supposed to. And again, if these um, kind of behavioral environmental changes don't help, it might be time to consider uh, using pharmacological interventions. But keep in mind now, if you have a person with Down syndrome and dementia, and they might be on an Alzheimer's medicine, an antidepressant, then you add a sleep medicine, and then you add XYZ, it gets very complicated very fast, and those drugs interact, and one leads to side effects, then you treat that side effect, and that leads to another side effect, and you treat that one. And before you know it, somebody is on a ridiculous number of medicines. Um, so, you know, exercise, common sense, and again, question your physicians about how these drugs interact. Ask your pharmacists. They really know this stuff. Um, be, be an advocate. Some of the drugs lead to more confusion. Okay, now comes, I think, kind of the fun stuff. And I'm going to talk and kind of update you on what some of the more promising lines of research are in the field when it comes to thinking about ways to prevent Alzheimer's disease. All of this work is based upon studies in animals, in other words, preclinical studies, and there are some studies in people with sporadic Alzheimer's disease. There is only one, one or two studies going on in familial Alzheimer's disease where we know essentially the age and that a person will get the disease. I don't think any of these have been done in Down syndrome. Yeah. Okay, I should clarify the question. So sporadic Alzheimer's disease accounts for about 95% of all the cases. Anybody, most people who develop Alzheimer's disease, it may run in families a little bit, but there's no genetic mutation that causes it that we know of yet. So people will develop Alzheimer's between 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years. The age of onset will differ, will differ um, how long they might have the disease will differ. It makes it really hard to understand and do prevention studies because we don't know when somebody's going to get disease. A very small percentage of people who develop Alzheimer's disease have a genetic mutation. And there are, it runs in certain families. There are several mutations that have been identified. They tend to be really tough because the age of onset can go down as low as 20 and it's very rapid and oftentimes people have had kids before they know they have this mutation. So it's hard on families uh, and it's completely 100 penetrant. Like just when you have that mutation, you're, it, it will happen. Kind of like Huntington's disease. When you have the, the, the genetics, you can't, you know, it's, it's pretty much inevitable. So there are a number of big studies, uh, Diane in the US, for example, dominantly inherited Alzheimer's network, that they're following a whole bunch of families with imaging, with blood work. And there's one arm on one study by Eric Ryman who's looking at a vaccine. So I can revisit that if you're interested. So, but the work I'm going to tell you about now is, is, is all going to be non-pharmacological, okay? I know we all want a pill. Pills are really not working very well right now, so we need to consider other, other avenues in terms of prevention. Also, if we want to think about prevention, again, if there was a medicine that we think maybe might prevent Alzheimer's disease, but you have to take it from 30s for the rest of your life, and it has this really awful side effect of incontinence, you might not want to do that. Or maybe it's really safe, okay, that's fine. We might be more willing to do something like that. So doing prevention studies it's really challenging. You need lots and lots of people, and they're very expensive to do. And most pharmaceutical companies who are a big driver of drug trials um, are less interested in doing this because it's feasibly very challenging. There are some ways we can dodge some of those bullets, and this is why this Diane study and that soft shoot is really important because we know these folks are going to develop dementia, and so we don't need as many people, and we don't need to follow them as long. All right, so I'm going to tell you a whole bunch of things that are pretty common sense, but I'm also going to show you some data or the underlying pinnings of why these approaches should work. And it focuses primarily, and what you've heard this morning, about modifying risk factors. 
we're getting a really good handle on what the risk factors are for developing Alzheimer's disease in general. For example, obesity increases your risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. If you have type 2 diabetes, it increases your risk. If your heart's not working well, if you have poor cardiovascular function, your brain has poor blood flow and blood function, and vessel function, and it can lead to small strokes. And you can have small strokes. You can make that Alzheimer's disease fatality come on even sooner. You can make it happen faster. It can reduce or lower the age of onset. Poor sleep, as I said. Obstructive sleep apnea is also another risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And as we go along, we're learning more and more additional risk factors that are telling us that people um, can maybe modify to keep increasing the age at when you would get a dementia if you're going to get it. And in fact, we want to increase it to the point where it'll be way past the point where you pass away for other reasons. That's the, the general goal. So I'm going to go through some of these in a little more detail. Um, and what's interesting about this is some of these risk factors have obvious interconnections. Obesity, it means lack of exercise. Lack of exercise means cardiovascular function isn't doing very well. You can imagine how that comes together. Diabetes is, is it's, it's a whole other disease, and, and changes in blood flow, et cetera, can look again, cardiovascular function, diabetes. So they're kind of interrelated, but that makes our life a little easier, because that means some of the interventions or prevention approaches I'm, I'm going to suggest are going to target a bunch of these risk factors all at one time. There's no pill that can do that yet. So I'm going to talk a little bit about diet. And, and in particular, I'm going to talk about antioxidants. I get asked a lot by families about antioxidant supplements as a way to prevent Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome, and even younger. And I know when you do a Google search for antioxidants and Down syndrome, you'll end up with a whole ton of products that are supposed to improve learning and memory and are based on antioxidant formulations. And it's not unreasonable to think antioxidants might be particularly useful or helpful for people with Down syndrome because of the genetics. And we know there are a number of genes on chromosome 21 that seem to lead to more oxidative damage in tissues and in brain. So thinking about antioxidants is not off the table. There are only two studies of antioxidants specifically that I know of in people with Down syndrome. One was published by Ira Lott when he did a combination study of vitamin E and C, lipoic acid, and acetylcarnitine. He asked to do this as a prevention study when he requested funding, but the reviewer said, no, 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 you have to do a treatment study first. So he recruited people with dementia who had Down syndrome. And of course, it's very hard to make people better. And we know everybody took the medicine because we could measure in blood their vitamin E was going up, but we didn't see any benefit in terms of clinical outcomes. Does that mean it might not be useful for prevention? We don't know. There was a big vitamin E study, and only one paper has been published about it, and I'm waiting to hear what the final outcome was. I do know that when you look at the, all the studies out there looking at things like vitamin E intervention to treat Alzheimer's disease or prevent it, they usually give us modest or negative outcomes. They don't work. Any kind, anytime you do a single compound, it seems like your chance of success is very low. And when you think about that, it kind of makes sense, because vitamin E is recycled by vitamin C. So you really want to kind of think about giving these things in combinations. Well, OK, what kind of combinations and what doses of each? And you can see it just starts to spiral. So there's a better idea. Eat well. And it's fun. Uh, so instead of thinking about taking high doses of vitamin E or C or buying one of those formulations online who charge you 80 bucks a pill, you know, there's nothing there that you can't get from food. And getting it from food and the way food is absorbed, those compounds are getting in and are much more bioavailable than what you might get a formulation for. And you're getting your combinations. Combinations are really the trick here. We're never going to boil this down to one thing. It's going to be a bunch of things. So the more pathways, like I said, the more things that are going wrong you can target with one kind of approach, the better you're going to be. So fruits and vegetables, of course, are very high in antioxidants. And there's some great books out there that say, talk about the color of your fruits and vegetables and what different kinds of phytochemicals they have and what their antioxidant um, power is. And um, there's some very good solid science about all those antioxidants in fruits and veggies. And I give you an example here of the Mediterranean diet. And that's not to say I'm suggesting everybody go on the Mediterranean diet. 
But I think the evidence for the Mediterranean diet in terms of protection from Alzheimer's disease in the general population is pretty good. It's pretty good. So this is one I kind of look at more. I've seen a lot of really nice papers that I think the studies were done really well. There are obviously other kinds of diets, and, and all these things need to be done in consult with, with your physician. But this diet's very simply full of fish, nuts and healthy oils, fruits and veggies. Um, and of course, there's wine and beer, which I kind of like. So I'm good with that. Uh, and of course, when you're eating a nice, healthy diet, you're getting your antioxidants naturally. They're probably getting into your brain better. And you're not overloading with one or another and imbalancing things. It can reduce obesity. Oh, they reduce that risk factor for dementia too. That would be wonderful. And your heart's probably going to work better because it's a nice healthy diet. You're not eating tons and tons of sodium and processed foods. So all these things right there, you're targeting a bunch of risk factors. And they're modifiable by diet. Now, I know it's a little bit more work, although cooking, I think, is great fun. And learning to cook is going to come in later. Exercise. There's still no treadmill in a pill. It's still kind of the old-fashioned way. There is a group in Louisiana, fantastic scientists, who are looking for mimetics for exercise. And what that means is we know some of the brain changes that happen in response to exercise, so they're trying to make uh, compounds that will mimic those changes in your brain. But in the meantime, it's the old-fashioned way. So I found, and really, it was really easy for me to find. If I look at exercise and Down syndrome on the Google machine, I can find lots of examples. And this fellow in particular, the weightlifter, is fantastic. His name is John. I think he's in the U United Kingdom. Really terrific. A very strong guy. And at the bottom, I have a picture from our Down Syndrome Association of Louisville, our Boogie Down dancers, who uh, put on a fantastic show. Exercise. And we have known this for at least two dozen years, uh, 20 years, from work in animals, is that if animals exercise, for example, if you give a mouse a running wheel and they exercise, they will start to grow new neurons in their brain, even if they're old. This is not a young, you can start this any time. It's, it's all going to benefit your brain. They grow new neurons, and I'll show you a picture of what that looks like. Importantly, they make growth factors in the brain. A big one is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So that's a, a molecule that gets released in the brain that leads to your neurons being healthier and making more synaptic connections and keeping those synapses and connections healthy. This is exercise. This is not a pill. It has a direct impact on your brain. There are suggestions about how much and how often you should be doing these exercises. And I'm not an exercise physiologist, so I'll just do the back pedal right there. But I know the most common recommendation is three to four times per week, 30 minutes of cardiovascular exercise. And it was mentioned earlier about personal trainers and group activities are great ways to kind of get this to happen. We're not talking running 20 miles a day. We're just talking potentially going for a walk. And if you're going for a walk, actually some other good things are going on. Go for a walk with an apple. So we don't know necessarily how much, how often. We need to do the studies. And I think those would be really promising studies to do. These are the studies that, that families are interested in that people with Down syndrome want to know about, too. So here's an example of a picture from a, a mouse that was exercised. And this is in the part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is critical for learning and memory in humans. It's one of the areas of the brain that tends to lose cells earliest with Alzheimer's disease, which is why you get the memory problems. These blue little dots are cells called dental granule cells that's what the mouse brain had to begin with, was born with. We're all born with all the neurons in our heads. Our, my neurons are 49 years old. And then you can see all kinds of these bright green cells. Those are new neurons. They've been born since that animal was born. So neurogenesis is the fancy term. It happens, you can do this quite a bit for rodents and birds. Birds do this naturally every time a uh, new season comes, they learn new songs, they make new songs. When they make new songs, they make new neurons. So evolutionarily, there's a purpose for this. There's a reason why we can do this. And there's some interesting data from people who are on chemotherapy and take a drug that lets us see which neurons are brand new when they come to autopsy. We know the human brain does it too. There are open questions. We don't know how functionally relevant those neurons are. Those neurons might not make connections completely. They might die. Um, and is that enough to support gaining back function? So we don't know. Rodents are kind of easy that way. You can, you know, 
Neuron, new neurons in a mouse or a rat means they get smarter. These things don't typically translate to people very well. But it can't be a bad thing if we can grow some new neurons. Cognitive exercises, cognitive training. And I know you guys are experts on this, cognitive training and developmental changes in the brain to support better fu function. I mean, it's coming back again when you get older. The bottom line is, is the more active your brain is, it's like a muscle. The more active your brain is, the more you use it, the less you lose. The more cognitive training, the fact that you're sitting here and listening to me yak away for a little bit of time, hopefully is causing some connections to be made, some growth factors to be released. I don't think I'm pushing new neurons, but I can always fantasize. Um, so cognitive exercises and using your brain and engaging your brain leads to blood flow getting into your brain too, just like exercise. And then again, in mouse studies, we know that like en en enrichment of the environment, which lets mice learn more things. They grow new neurons again. We get more of these growth factors. And this is a good prevention strategy because if you start really considering doing things in middle age or even in older age, it doesn't matter. The more connections you have, then that means the more damage you can tolerate. So you've probably heard about compensation. This is what we think is going on for people um, that the more connections you have, the more damage you can take. For example, uh, we know that people who have had many more, had more years of education are protected, more protected against Alzheimer's disease than people who have less years of education. And the underlying hypothesis is that those people who go to school for a long, long time make more connections in their brains. And that way, if, and then if and they develop Alzheimer's disease, they have a lot further to come down before you start to see clinical science. So it may not necessarily be changing the Alzheimer's disease, but it's giving their brain way more buffering power. And that's something we can do, again, by training. And cognitive exercises don't have to be dull. Um, they can be things like computer games, board games, card games, Sudoku, crosswords, talking in general, anything anybody likes to do that really engages cognitive um, activity is going to be a really good thing. And it will lead to these neurons getting, making more and more connections. So this fellow is learning how to make a sandwich, even in his old age. Okay, it's never too late to learn how to cook, so maybe cook a Mediterranean diet. Be a good way to put those two together. Playing me an instrument, music. Wonderful for the brain. There's some really nice data for that, too, in the general population. And another, and again, some of these might seem painfully obvious, but you'd be surprised by the data out there that really supports this. Social activities are a huge part of healthy brain aging. There are a number of epidemiological studies in the general population showing that people who have very active social lives, who have more friends, uh, or go to church a lot, which is a very social activity, tend to be protected from Alzheimer's disease. There's, this is for real. There's also a biological basis for this. Again, some of the same pathways. That's why we just keep hitting those pathways. We just want to keep buffering the brain and giving it all the tools it needs to withstand this Alzheimer's pathology. Again, the more active one is, you see the brains, pe people's brains are bigger. Their hippocampus is bigger. And they might show a, sl a slower decline if they do develop early signs of dementia. So it's about making connections, because usually when you're being social, you might be engaging your cognitive exercises and your physical exercises. Go for a walk with friends, join a dance club, engage multiple uh, types of activities like this, and put them all together so it stacks up in the brain to protect it. More friends, the better. So the future. Um, what's happening? what's going on now, and I put this picture in because uh, it actually pertains to a study that's going on now. This is a study in progress. Uh, the Rx, the treatment, is 100 bottles of wi red wine per day. Two shines. And this uh, stems from uh, studies of Reservatrol. <laughs> I don't know if you, if you heard of Reservatrol in the C in, on Google, CNN or whatever. So uh, um, some beautiful work by uh, a researcher showing that one of the compounds in red wine, we know red wine is good for your brain over and over and over again. One of the successes of people who live to very old age without dementia is they drink red wine or they drink coffee. So this is really good news. Um, and somebody that took a good look at what's going on. Red wine we know has lots of antioxidants, so we know that should be good for your brain. 
But there was this another compound, resveratrol, which apparently is, is, can modify one of the molecular pathways in the brain that can lead to healthier brain aging. The problem is it's in such small quantities in a bottle of wine, there's no way you could actually do a clinical trial with bottles of red wine. You'd have to have 100 bottles per day. But he's isolated the compound and, and concentrated it so you can do it in, a, in a, a pill formation. They're doing studies now with this. As I said, remember, there's never going to be a one pill answer to this. I'd rather drink the red wine. Um, <clears throat> but that is some of the studies that are going on now. Uh, so there's, there's lots of drugs in the pipeline. Um, pharma, big pharma companies got a little scared off for a while because everything that they had been trying and testing on clinical trials were failing. They were failing, failing, failing. The, probably the hottest thing still going now is vaccines. Um, I can tell you a little bit about those. And thinking about a vaccine for preventing or treating Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome is not off the table. But I think there's some very important caveats we need to think about before we, we run at this. And that is, again, the genetics and the background are different. There's, there's different things going on here. And I'll give you an example when it comes to vaccines. So vaccines were initially developed, I think, in the early 90s by Dale Schenck at Atlanta Pharmaceuticals. And he had this kind of crazy idea, well, what if we vaccinate mice against this beta amyloid protein and stimulate their bodies to make antibodies? And those antibodies will attack the peptide, right? And, and maybe cure Alzheimer's disease. And it worked. It worked great in mice. And he got, I think, a nature paper. I mean, it was the cure. He could take young mice before they had mouse Alzheimer's disease. These are tr genetically modified animals to make plaques. And he could prevent plaques, and those animals stayed smart. Or he could take older mice, get rid of the plaques from the brain, and make those mice smart. So everybody raced off clinical trials, boom, boom, boom. Let's take this right to clinical trials for, for patients with Alzheimer's disease. And something unfortunate happened. I think conceptually that approach was good. It made good sense. The fact that it worked was really kind of surprising, but now we understand the mechanism. Because antibodies are huge. They don't get in the brain. And that's where the plaques are. So it works in a slightly different way. It turns out that there's, when you vaccinate in this way, you have to mix the beta amyloid peptides, so the antibodies are created with an adjuvant that stimulates the immune system to make antibodies. Well, that adjuvant made people sick. So they had to stop the study early. And now we know what happened. But this was an example of going too quick, jumping right from mice straight to people without some additional follow-ups. And I can understand why that happened. I mean, everybody, we want a cure so bad, everybody can taste it. Vaccines are still super promising. Um, some of the more recent data using a different approach to vaccinating, that is giving the antibodies themselves by an infusion. There's going to be a problem with that, obviously, in the future, just for, in terms of how much antibody can be made and having to be infused for an hour, maybe once a month. I mean, it's, it's going to be a tough, a tough thing, but if it works, it works. The latest uh, really promising data are that um, those vaccines don't necessarily uh, cure the dementia. Uh, it doesn't slow it down. They still, people still do get worse, most of them. But when some of those people have come to autopsy, they've had fewer plaques. So it's working in the brain. It doesn't seem to be slowing down the disease at that stage. Now they've gone and looked at younger, or at people who are in earlier stages of dementia, and they're having a bigger impact with this vaccine. It's actually you know, slowing things down a lot better. So this is telling us a vaccine might be way more effective if used as a prevention tool. Again, that's what I mean about prevention. Would you be willing to be vaccinated once a month? You know, How important is it to you to have those risks and how much can you invest time-wise and potentially in the US? Who knows, it might be a cost to you. So I'm worried about, I think like I said vaccines I think are really promising. So the concern I have for thinking about this for people with Down syndrome is this. The kinds of inflammation we see in the brains of people with Down syndrome is different than what we're seeing in people with sporadic Alzheimer's disease. So because of the genetics, they have a, a different kind of inflammation in their brains. The vaccine increases that kind of inflammation as a side effect of the vaccine, of the stimulation of the immune system. So I think 
And I know there are a number of folks and, and, and potentially companies who are very interested in trying these vaccines in people with Down syndrome. They would like to take this information and, and say that it's going to prevent Alzheimer's in, in the general population. And I think we need to take a step back and really understand what's going on and what's safe. I don't want to deprive the same uh, people with Down syndrome with the same opportunities, but I would like to see a little bit more work to make sure that these things aren't going to lead to adverse effects. The last thing we want to do is make people sicker. And this happens for a lot of drugs, a lot of drugs. There is very little consideration to all the different pathways those drugs affect that are different in people with Down syndrome. So I think a, a, a researcher is really thinking about this as, okay, this drug works like this. I know that's a little different in Down syndrome. And maybe I better think about this a bit because it might make this pathway worse for people with Downs instead of making it better. So again, keep your eyes peeled, be a little bit critical. Um, that don't not take advantage of clinical trial opportunities, but be very educated when you go in. Because eventually we have to do those studies properly. Otherwise, just like with the Alzheimer's medicines now, we, we don't know if they work and if they make people worse. We, we really need to understand this to do good by our friends with Down syndrome. Okay, so let me summarize. Um, you knew kind of all of this stuff probably coming in, as we know that people with Down syndrome are at a higher risk for Alzheimer's and an earlier age of onset. And as I emphasize, I'm not so sure it's completely 100%. That there might be some other protective things going on that we can try to manipulate and, and make better. I talked a little bit about treating the disease, Alzheimer's disease, when it's in play, how to manage the environment, to make that person comfortable, pharmacological, non-pharmacological approaches. And I told you about at least a handful of ways to potentially intervene, reduce your risk factors. These are things you can start doing today. And they have a huge impact on your brain, a huge impact. And these are the, the, the ones that I chose to present to you, and there's others, were the ones I thought the data were most solid. And these would be the ones I would probably design a prevention trial for. I would probably be really interested in, say, exercise. Even if somebody's older with Down syndrome and they have arthritis and they're a little not as mobile, even just strength exercises has a, is a big impact because the heart going and the brain gets happy. And there are new treatments in the pipeline. Um, hopefully something is going to come out that'll be potentially really good for people with Down syndrome. So take home message, eat lots of fruits and veggies, exercise, make it fun. It doesn't have to be that horrible 30 minute cardio exercise video. Dancing, Zumba, playing sports, swimming, all kinds of goodies. Make lots of friends, keep your friends, visit a lot, exercise with your friends, eat with your friends, play lots of games, learn new things, learn how to play an instrument, take classes, uh, make sure you're getting good sleep. And all of these things in combination, and they're not hard to do, are in theory going to reduce your risk factors. And then hopefully there'll be a better quality of life as people age with Down syndrome. Prevention is always going to be far more powerful than treatment. So be active and proactive. And I put some great pictures of our neurologists with some of our, our uh, study volunteers. Um, they really, really love Dave Powell. He's our physicist. They're, they're big fans of, of Dave. And um, advocate and self-advocate on, on supporting research. Research doesn't have to have that nasty tone. A lot of studies that are going on now are really just watching watching what's happening, watching what's changes, changing. And the folks in our study really do enjoy coming to see us. It's not a scary thing. Uh, and volunteer as best you can. And here's my happy pictures at the end of being positive. It's, you know, nothing is inevitable. So with that, I'll end. And there's my horse picture because I'm Kentucky. <laughs> Thank you. I can answer questions.